Welcome back to another episode of Your Hope-Filled Perspective, where it's always our goal to restore hope, renew minds, and empower listeners to live in their God-given identity. Have you ever experienced regret? I don't know that there's a single person who could say no. But what we're going to talk about today is how God's word gives you hope to break free from the regrets that are holding you back. And with me on today's show is my friend Rhonda Stoppy, who is known to be the no regrets woman. But before I introduce her, I want to take us to the word of God, since that's what we're talking about today, how God's word gives you hope for breaking free from regrets. Today, I want us to focus on Philippians 3, 13 through 14, that says, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What God's talking about there is not living in regrets, but looking forward not necessarily forgetting the past, but not making that our focus. So today we're gonna talk with Rhonda Stoppy, who is the No Regrets Woman. She's got over 30 years of experience helping women live a no regrets life. She teaches, she speaks, she authors many books, and we're gonna put all of her information for you to connect with her in our show notes at drmichelleb.com but she is not alone in her ministry. She serves in ministry with her husband, Steve, who for 20 years has pastored the First Baptist Church of Patterson, California. But their greatest ministry is their family. Together, they have four grown children and 10 grandchildren. Welcome back to the program, Rhonda. Thank you. It's so good to be back with you. So often our passion comes out of our own hurts and trials and experiences. So today we're going to talk about how God's word gives us hope to break free from the regrets that hold us back. So I have to ask you, what brought you to write and speak about breaking free from regrets? My husband has been in ministry for 30 years. We were in youth ministry for 18 years, and he has pastored this as a senior pastor of the church we're at now. And regret over and over again is where women are stuck. They regret that abortion that they had. They regret that that marriage that they felt like they failed at. They regret the uh, children that they raised for their own glory instead of the glory of the Lord. And they, they regret fill in the blank and regret just keeps them stuck. And they don't realize we all do things that we regret. We all are broken people and we all will operate in our flesh and do things that and all of us are thinking about that thing right now that we're like, oh, I just wish I never would have happened in my life. I wish I didn't have to think about that. I hope no one ever finds out about that. If people knew that about me and that's, I can't tell you how many times women will come to this church and say, oh, if the women in the church knew this about me, they wouldn't accept me. And I'm like, honey, I know the stories of the women in this church. They all have stories. They all have those things that they wish they could have, you know, go back and never, you know, never have done, but they have found forgiveness in Christ because the word of God says that God takes sins is from the west not north from south because if you travel north you're eventually going to travel south but if i start traveling east i will never meet west god says it's gone and it will never be thrown in your face but we remember it and we feel the shame of it and the enemy you know what let's look at what he did to even the garden he tempted her to question god's goodness he tempted her to believe that this fruit was going to bring good to her life, that she ate of that fruit. And then she was the one who gave it to her husband. And then think about what happened. God comes to walk with them in the cool of the day. And he did it every day, but this day they had shame. So they pulled away. They hid from God who loved them, who created them to delight in them, but their shame hid them. And then God calls them and says, Hey, Adam, where are you? Exactly. 
He had him be aware your sinful choice has now alienated you from me. So let's deal with that. Let's clean it up. Let's do something about that. And so God says, what happened? And what does Adam do? He throws Eve under the bus. Well, it's because of her. And it's really your fault, God, because you gave her to me. So really it's everybody's fault, but mine. And what do we do with our regret? We oftentimes blame someone else. We oftentimes blame God. You know, if I had had better parents, I wouldn't be so insecure. If I had had a husband who loved me like her husband loves her, I would be a better wife. I would be, you know, all those things. We blame, 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 blame. And we get stuck in these regretful relationships, in this regretful resentment. And think about Eve, who had never had a fight with her husband in her life. And then all of a sudden she's being betrayed by him to their creator, how, how betrayed she must have felt and what regret she must have had knowing this is because I ate that fruit. We all have eaten of that fruit. And I remember one time I was teaching a Bible study and one woman said, you know, if I'd have been in the garden, I would have just obeyed God. I wouldn't have eaten the fruit. I know I wouldn't have. And I'm like, then the first sin probably would have been pride. <laughs> 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 out of the fact that you didn't eat the fruit, <laughs> but we all have to come to that place of knowing, uh, Satan wants to keep us ashamed and alienated. And I'm the only one who's ever done this thing or experienced this thing, or, you know, regret and lay it at the foot of the cross and know that it, the Bible says that though your sins are as scarlet, I wash you whiter than snow. And then believing that I love God reveals in scripture stories of people that were his servants that messed up big time. We all know David and Bathsheba's story. David sent for Bathsheba. She came. She was a married woman. He didn't order her. He didn't rape her. She came willingly. And we can blame David all we want, you know, and it's like, oh, she was his subordinate and she was just doing okay. But she came willingly. And she slept with him and, you know, he kills Uriah and all of that to hide their sin. And then he takes her into his home and he basically pretends to be a godly King for about a, about a year until God sends Nathan, the prophet who says, you are the man. And then he finally is broken and, and repents. But David describes that year of, oh, the bones that you were crushing within me. I, the sin was so heavy upon me. Against you and you only have I sinned. But when someone loved David enough to call him on his sin so that he could be broken before the Lord and repent and be washed whiter than snow, he says, then I will teach sinners your way. Then his ministry is powerful. Then God can use him from his brokenness, from his humility, from his sinful past now he can use him in ways he never could have used him because of his brokenness. And if you're here today and you're listening to this, know that because of that regret, because of that sin, because of your brokenness, God can take it. If you humble yourself, if you repent, which means agree with God, that it was sin, don't blame anybody else. And then let God wash you right whiter than snow. And then the, the worship for him will be sweeter the joy in him will be profound, the zeal to be used by him. And he will do through you more than you ever imagined from your place of brokenness and humility. Well, and to be clear, this is not just for women. I've got a male right. and female audience, right? And we all experience those regrets. Mm -hmm. But I think it's so important to really emphasize what you were talking about, Rhonda, that the enemy comes in first to tempt mm -hmm. and we take the bait and then he comes around afterwards and shames us because we took his bait right. mm -hmm. but God provides us repentance not as a punishment but as a gift to restore that relationship after we've taken the bait and that gift is available to all of us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In your 30 years of mentoring in the church, what do you think is the number one thing that you've learned about regret? It keeps us stuck. Yeah. It keeps us stuck. Uh, you know, okay, here's an example. Um, Peter in the Bible. Peter was like on fire. Peter was like, Jesus, 
I'll go to the death with you. I will die with you. He's going to cross, you know, he's going to die. Peter's like, don't even talk like that. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. Like, don't even change God's plan because I know that this isn't going to be great, but God has a plan. And Peter in his zeal was trying to do what was right. And, you know, he rips out this, this knife and he cuts off Malchus's ear and he's going to fight. And Jesus puts his ear back on and says, Peter, it, it's not going to happen that way. Don't you know that I could call a myriad of angels right now and say everybody out of the pool party over, but this is how God has it planned. And he told Peter, you're going to deny me before the cock crows. You're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, I will never deny you. I will never do that. And, you know, the Bible says to him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. When we see someone hasn't who had an affair, I would never, ever do that. When we see someone that would have worked, would never do when we see who in the blank. When we think I would never do that, be careful. Yeah. Cause I would, I would, I know who I am without Christ. And I am a self-serving, arrogant, prideful, insecure, uh, self-promoting woman who wants to be affirmed by men. I know who I am without him. And God has rescued me from who I was raised to be the heritage of the women in my family. And he has set me on a different path. He changed the trajectory of my life because of Christ in me, the hope of glory. So when Peter was so confident that he would not deny Christ, of course he does three times. And in that moment, God is always in the moments. The providence of God is in the moments of our life. In the moment, as he denied the third time and the cock crowed, Jesus walked out and their eyes met in that moment. Can you imagine in that moment, the, the regret that Peter felt, the rem he remembered that Jesus said, tonight, you're going to deny me. No, I'll never deny you. And not only did he do it, but Jesus heard his final denial in their eyes met and he went out and he wept. And what do we find, Peter? He went fishing. I'm done. God can't, I'm going to go back to what I'm good at. I'm a good fisherman. I'm, I'm a real good fisherman. My career before all this, I knew who I was. I knew how to be successful. I'm going back to that. And here's the thing. When God has leaders, when you're a leader, people follow you. So where were the other disciples? Fishing with Peter. And then we know the story. Jesus comes on the shore and he's making some fish. And then Jesus sees, or Peter sees on the shore and he realizes it's Jesus and he jumps in the water and he swims to him. It's the Lord. I love that. And then G Peter still has a shame. He still has his regret. And Jesus is asking him, do you love me? Well, Lord, you know that I love you. But do you love me? You know that I love you. Lord, you know that I phileo you. I am your friend. And then Jesus says, feed my sheep. When we fail and we will, that's when Jesus comes and meets us at the point of our failure. And he says, now you're ready. Now I'm going to use you powerfully because on this rock, Peter, I'm going to build my church before. If I would have used you, you would have been like, look what I did for God. I built this church for Jesus. And God's like, I got to bring you to the end of yourself and your own uh, self-worth or thinking you can do this by your bootstraps and in your brokenness. Now I can entrust you with a platform. Now I can entrust you with a ministry. With David and Bathsheba, God said, now I can entrust Bathsheba to be the mother of Solomon, the next king of Israel. The brokenness, the shame, David had other wives. That's a whole nother book to write. <laughs> but, but God, after David repented, he went into Bathsheba, the woman who he had sinned with. And they were the ones who conceived the next king of Israel, Solomon, because when God forgives, he forgives to the utmost. The thing about regrets and shame is that the enemy is so loud in our ear saying things like, you're the only one. Nobody will understand. God can't forgive this sin. And then we tend to keep those circumstances secret. And as long as they are kept secret and in the dark, they hold power. Mm -hmm. 
but the gift that God has offered through repentance brings it out into the light. Mm -hmm. And then it never holds that same power again. And God can use it for his glory. Rhonda, we had you on a previous episode of the podcast and you shared about postpartum depression. And I want listeners to go back and hear that story. But what I love about that is that we can feel shame even over things that were not our fault. Mm -hmm. But God will use those to help other people who are going through the same thing now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have a thought um, in my book, Real Life Romance. It's a collection of love stories. And one of the stories is Chuck and Angie in the book. And we knew Chuck and Angie from our youth ministry in Texas. And they they worked alongside of us in youth ministry. And we watched them fall in love with each other. It was really precious. And and they both were virgins and they got married and they were so ready to serve the Lord. We're going to be this couple. And one day Angie stumbled on her computer the reason why her husband hadn't been as interested in her in the marriage bed as she had expected, she found pornography and she cried and she presented it to him and he cried. He asked her forgiveness and he said, I started looking at it when I was in junior high and this was new internet in people's homes. The parents had no idea what their son was even looking at. But he said, I had myself convinced I wanted to be a virgin when I got married and looking at porn was my way to keep myself sexually pure, sexually pure. I'm putting up air quotes Um, in a junior high boy's mind. That makes sense until I get married. But after they got married, he couldn't put it away because anyone knows what you feed your flesh, your flesh craves. And it was a door he opened that he did not know how to close. So he was a Shame felt regret, and he asked her forgiveness, and he asked her to keep it a secret, and they were gonna, she was gonna be his accountability partner and help him do better. Well, anyone who knows how this works, you know, when your wife's asking you how you doing with that, or hey, I saw on the computer, it's disrespectful. It's coming. It actually drives him away instead of toward her, um, and it didn't work. And I oftentimes will explain to wives whose husbands are addicted to pornography. Imagine if you had put on some weight after that baby and you really want to lose those pounds and you ask your husband, hey, will you help me exercise and eat better and lose some weight? And he's like, sure, babe, I'd love to help you. And one night he walks by the freezer and you're like the glow of the freezer light and you're eating some Ben and Jerry's and he's like, moo. And you're like, did you just say that to me right now? Does that help you want to do better? No, it actually drives you to your closet to eat Twinkies because you did not feel affirmed or encouraged. You felt shamed. So for women whose husbands are struggling, or if you're a man and you're struggling with pornography, understand that shaming isn't really going to help you do better. It's actually going to drive you probably to the computer even more. And I'm not excusing it. It is sin and it is devastating to a man, to a marriage. It's wrong. But Angie says this, and I love the insight. She said, it wasn't until I realized that Chuck's addiction to pornography was just as sinful as my sin of resenting him, that I was ready to repent of my own sin so that I could pray powerfully for my husband to get the help he needs. I love that because when we're so resentful towards someone who's wronged us, someone who has uh, repeatedly wrongs us, we can't even pray powerfully for the Holy Spirit to do a work in them. It renders our prayers powerless. If you want to be Moses on a mountain with your arms in the air, interceding for this generation, for your children, your grandchildren, for whoever, if you're stuck in sin, your arms aren't raised in intercession. They are not powerful prayers. And once she repented, she said they started asking the Lord to send help. And Chuck found other men that were willing to be honest about their shameful past, their journey in breaking free from pornography. And I think in the church, that is a hidden sin among men, among couples. They think if anyone knew that my husband was struggling with pornography, you know, they would not respect us. They would, whatever it is. And I'm not, wives don't go to the church and talk in your ladies Bible study about your husband's pornography addiction. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying husbands get help from someone who's walked the path ahead of you. Uh, There's focus on the family has great resources, private counselors. There's I'm sure other places that you can go. That's where they went was focus on the family. And that's where they started their journey. 
and they got connected with other couples who had gone through the same struggle. But Satan likes to keep it a secret. I'll try harder. I'll do better next time. And we need to confess our sins to one another so that we have people praying for us. We have people encouraging us. We have people showing us a way out of where we are stuck. Such good advice and biblical advice, because it's when we confess our sins to another that it comes out of the darkness and Satan doesn't have the same power anymore. And when Jesus was on the cross and said, it is finished, he's talking about our shames and our regrets and our sin, but he's created a way for us to reconcile with God. Friends, we're going to take a real short commercial break. But I want you to stick with us because when we come back, we're going to be talking with Rhonda even more about how God's word gives us hope for overcoming those regrets that hold us back. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your hope filled perspective where today I'm talking with my friend Rhonda Stoppi and we are talking about how God's word gives us hope for overcoming the regrets that hold us back. And we all have regrets in our life. Irana, you've been in ministry with your husband for a long time. What are some of the biggest areas of regret where we get stuck? Uh, you know, for myself, I'm, I'm working through one right now. Uh, I shared, I think, in the last episode that we were on that my sister just died and her autopsy hasn't come through yet, but we're pretty sure it was an overdose. And um, my sister was a highly functioning, uh, very successful uh, and our family had kind of done an intervention with her several years back. And my brother had, it was kind of a surprise thing. She came to visit and my brother who had been hit, has his own background of alcoholism and such, and has come to Christ. And he just kind of sprang it on all of us that we were there. We're going to do this right now. At first I'm like, Oh, this is going to add. And I'm that we did it because we all got to say, I'm afraid that one night when my phone rings, that it's you, that someone's going to tell me they found you dead. And that's where your path is headed. And that's what we're afraid for, for you. And we shared the gospel with her. We shared our hope in Christ with her. And then there was a, a season of just kind of like not being in her life. Uh, and I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it was a, a time where it was just like, okay, you go do your thing. And, and I'm not going to tell all the story, but there was a season of that. And so 2019, I was going to go speak in um, the city that she lived in. And I was in California and I was going to fly to the city and I was going to speak. And I, I had planned to go visit her after the speaking engagement. And um, I shattered my wrist and I couldn't go. And then I was getting same speaking engagement in 2020. I'm going to go see her after the, after the speaking engagement. 20, nobody anywhere. engagement because of COVID. And I was disappointed that I didn't get to go see her. And then in 2021, I was going to go to a conference and I got COVID and I couldn't go to the conference and I couldn't go see her. And then the very next month, I got a phone call from her daughter that she had passed away. My regret was that I just wanted one more chance to share the gospel with my sister. Uh, my hope was that she would come to Christ. My mom, I led my mom to Christ six months before she passed away. We didn't know she was going to die, but my mom had resisted and resisted. And finally, one day, um, the Lord opened her understanding to her need for a savior. As I was sharing, she started weeping and she surrendered her heart to Christ. It was amazing. My great uncle, who's really the grandpa in my life, um, I got to lead him to the Lord's, uh, he was 80, he died, and we buried him on his 82nd birthday, and he was the crotchety old uh, cowboy that was like mad when my dad came to Christ because he didn't want anything to do with it, and I got to lead him to Christ, and my hope was that God was going to let me lead my sister to Christ. And my hope was that that was going to be that one opportunity that I was going to have. And when I got the text that from my niece that just basically said, mom's dead. I just threw the phone down. I was at VBS at church. I was, at, we have a coffee thing for the moms at VBS vacation Bible school. I was sitting at a table with a bunch of moms and I just began weeping because in that moment, hope was lost. Hope was lost. And I know your show is hope prevails and hope in my heart was lost for her. So my regret has been, oh, I should have just moved heaven and earth to go one more time. And my brother who has walked the path that she has walked has spoken so much truth into my life and has helped me not stay stuck in that regret. 
that, and my husband who said the last conversation you had with her, it was a phone call was sharing the gospel with her was asking her to examine herself to see if she's of the faith, asking her to get alone with the Lord and repent and really seek God to know that she really knows him and not just knows about him. He said, that was your last conversation with her. If you had gone to see her and it turned into something ugly, which it most likely would have, that would have been your last, last conversation. And the Lord said, no. So sometimes our regret is out of our control, but we still like, oh, if only, if only I could have fixed this, if I could have one more. And so I'm, I'm walking through that right now. And, and my having people with solid foundation of truth in their life, speak God's truth into my life has been so helpful because it's easy to get stuck in just, oh, I just wish I would have tried harder. You've experienced it yourself, which is so powerful because then you can speak to it. And I think sometimes God allows us to go through things so that we understand, so that then we can minister to others. So how do we turn to God's word in order to break free from those regrets that hold us back? I mean, the, the regrets can be everything from, I didn't have my children in a, in a Christian school to, I stayed at a job longer than I knew God wanted me to stay there to I had an affair. I mean, it can be big, small, anything in between, because here's what I know is that the enemy will take our sin and magnify it to the utmost, to the point that we are so ashamed and so embarrassed mm -hmm. that we even believe we're the only one. So how do we use God's word to break free from these regrets? You know, even as you were talking about that, I was thinking of women that have food issues, that have food triggers. In fact, uh, I don't know if you know who Amber Leah is. If not, you should have her on your show. She has a new book coming out called Food Triggers. I just saw the cover for it. And I'm super excited. Um, and there's a shame in our food is what helps us feel better in the moment. And we think we're the only one and, the, and those clothes don't fit anymore. We don't want our husband to see us without clothes on. Or if you're a man, you don't want your wife to see you in the swimming pool without your t-shirt on and you know all those things. And we know that food comforts for, a, and, and it can be just, it doesn't have to be the major affair that you had or, or whatever. It can be just whatever is where you're stuck. The enemy can get a hold of us and can just keep us stuck there. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It reveals the thoughts and intents of my own heart. You will never see yourself more clearly than through the lens of scripture. If you're not a person who studies the word, Paul's word to Timothy was study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth breaks us free from being stuck in any of our shame. It, the enemy, what works by us stuck in our, in our regret, in our shame, then he's just going to keep it up because if he can, if he can render you powerless, then that's one less servant of the most high God. That's going to be out there proclaiming freedom that Christ can set you free from whatever bondage that you're in. And the joy of the Lord can be your strength. And the peace that surpasses all understanding can rule in your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And your relationships, even though people are going to let you down, are not going to destroy you. You're going to be able to love others with Christ's selfless love, even when they're not lovable. That is what glorifies God. That is the light that shines. And Jesus said, let your light shine so that others will see your good works and glorify God. And not so that you work harder to do good works. People could person. No, it's instead of that, in the midst of your, your painful past, that as God joyfully serves others through you, that's the light. And let's begin at home with our children. I actually have... 13 grandchildren now and two more on the way. And there we have a baby factory over here. It's super fun. <laughs> but I have grandchildren. I don't know how long I'm going to have with them before I'm not going to. I just turned 60 years old. I want them to remember their grandmother walking in joy, loving the Lord. Is this is the world a crazy place right now? A yeah. Am I worried about my grandkids and what the future looks like for them? Yeah. Do I get stuck in anxiety about what might it might cost them to be followers of Christ in their generation? Yeah. 
but I have to take all of those cares and lay them at Jesus' feet. I have to know that God chose Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego to be captivated or taken captive by the Babylonians for such a time as that. That he chose Esther to be married to a horrible, wicked king. That was, do the history study on Xerxes. He was horrific. But God chose her for such a time as this for a purpose that he had for her life. If I don't know the word of God, if I'm not ready to take my anxieties and my fears and take them to the word, to unpack truth, to set aside my anxieties, to set aside my, my fears of what might be, then I will be stuck there. But if I do, like Paul, he said, forgetting what lies behind. What was he forgetting? Okay, Paul, when his name was Saul, was holding the cloaks of the people who were throwing stones at young Stephen, the young man with the face of an angel. He was cheering them on to murder that precious young man. You don't think there were times that he was laying in a prison cell and maybe had a flashback in his mind, a memory of that sweet face being hit with stones and his own voice cheering them on. You don't think he says, forgetting what lies behind, press on, take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ, lay it at the foot of the cross and know that God, that's not who you are in Jesus. You are set free from that. And you are a servant of the most high God. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities of darkness and those fiery darts of the enemy of, of doubt, of uh, anxiety, of shame, of regret, of resentment are what he uses to render us powerless for the kingdom purposes that God has for our lives. There's so much power in taking every thought captive because where the enemy gets us with respect to our sin and our guilt and our shame and our regrets is in our mind. Mm -hmm. And by taking every thought captive and bringing it to obedience in Christ Jesus, which means we have the same mind as Christ. We believe what Christ believes. We believe God's word. Then we recognize that God has already forgiven us. But repentance is our way of acknowledging to God. I get it. I messed up. And I want to do it your way. Yes. Mm -hmm. You and your husband are both in ministry. And I would be curious to hear how men struggle with regret and how that's different with how women struggle. I feel like with men, they don't talk about it. They um, muscle up. They go back, Peter, they go fishing. You know what? I'm going to do what entertains me. I'm going to do what I'm good at. I'm going to do what I enjoy. I'm going to hang out with my buddies. I'm not going to talk about, uh, I have a, a family member who's a police officer. And I spoke at a blue line wives meeting uh, last year, whenever there wasn't COVID. And I, one of the speakers that came and talked to these wives of police officers, she said, um, your husband, and there were some wives in there that were, or men in there that were married to you, you get it. Anyway, your, your spouse needs a place to decompress. They need to talk about their day. They need to tell you, I wiped up somebody's brains off the ground today. I busted into a, a room and I didn't know what was going to be on the other side of that door today. That they need an ear that can listen and have empathy because what they'll do, because the wives usually say, I can't know what you do all day. I can't know. It makes me too afraid. And I get it. It's, it's, go talk. You know, if you're a man and your wife can't swing it, I get it. Talk to your pastor, find another friend that you can talk to. But what these guys do is they'll all like meet up for breakfast after the night shift. And then they'll start telling what they did. You know, like I was holding this guy and he died in my arms. Oh, well, let me tell you what happened to me one time. And they all have their one up stories. It's not empathy. Yeah. It's sharing stories. And I think that's a lot of times where men have friends that they share their stories with maybe, but it's not a, to an empathetic ear. And honestly, I'm a wife that my husband can't tell me every single person that he's met with at church and everybody that's dealing with marriage troubles and all of that stuff. It's like, I can't bear those burdens. And God called him to that ministry, not me, but he has men in his life that he can talk to that have an empathetic 
ear for the ministry. Uh, that I feel like is important for men. Find a man, find a group of men. A men's Bible study is golden because you're studying the word together. As being the word together, it reminds us of things that maybe the Lord had rescued us from in our past, or it convicts us of something that it's time to repent. And we're going to talk about it because we're in this room. I am more knit together in the hearts and minds and lives of people that I study the word with than people that I have stuff in common with, because the word is what knits our lives together. So for men, if you're a man out there and you're saying, oh, you know, I just don't really have anybody that I can really talk to start by going to a men's Bible study. If you don't have a church family, oh my word, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as such as the habit of some. And all the more as we see the day approaching in case you didn't realize it, the day is approaching. You need to be in a church family. Your family needs to be in a church. If you're a divorced single man or you're a single guy and you have no get to a church body, because that is where you will grow. That is where you will serve. That's where you will break free from regrets that you may not even know you have. I talk through things. I don't even know what's going on in here until it's coming out. And then I'm like, oh, I'm kind of stuck there. <laughs> but men muscle up. And you know, if they do try it, they say something and then you know, the wife is like, well, just don't do that. Or you should do this. You should do that. Like I, my husband will say, I'm going to tell you something and I'm not asking you to fix it. I just want you to be aware of it. And I have to stop myself because I'm a fixer. You know, he'll say when our kids were young and we were on a tight budget, he was a pastor. Uh, be real careful with just spend the budget today for groceries and nothing else. My immediate, I need to go get a job. I need to go back to work. If I would go back to work, I can make all this go away. You can homeschool the younger ones while I do that. And he'd be like, I'm not asking you to fix it. I'm just asking you to watch your budget. So finding men, finding other men that they can interact with beginning, I think, in a Bible study. And now with technology, you can do a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting and then serve others. Like that, I feel like not just how can I get from others, but I want to give where God has broken me free from my regrets. That is, man, that's healing for anyone. Yeah. Friends, we're going to take a real quick commercial break let you know this program is your hope-filled perspective. So when we come back, I'm going to ask Rhonda to share her hope-filled perspective with respect to breaking free from the regrets that hold us back. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective. We've had a great conversation today about breaking free from regret. And I'm so thankful for this conversation, Rhonda, because this is not a topic we've ever covered before, but it is something that's so universal. And what I'm wondering as we wrap up this episode is that if a listener is struggling with regrets over their past, what hope-filled perspective would you leave them with today? God is bigger than your regret. Mm -hmm. And God saw it. He sees. He knows. He is the God who sees, the God who hears. Uh, and he is the God who takes all things and works it together for good to those who love him and to those that are called according to his purpose. A lot of times we just want to say, God, God causes all things to work together for good. I'm going to go live my life now. Time out. He said to those who love him, which Jesus said is the priority of life, that you fall in love with him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That takes the rest of your life knowing who he is so that you can love him like that. Get in the word, fellowship with others who love God. I can remember telling God, I don't love you like that. I love you for what I can get out of you. I know how selfish I am. I want to love you the way you asked me to, but I don't know how. Will you love you through me? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. If God's asking us to do something in Philippians, Paul said, it is God who works in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. He gives you the want to, and then he makes it happen. But we have got to take those thoughts captive that keep us stuck in regret, thinking that God could never use me. What if Peter had just, that he would have been the best fisherman in his generation, but we would have never heard from him again. Having the courage to say, God, I don't know what you can do with my mess, but I have hope that you can take the things that were done to me that I had no power over, the things that I've done that I did have power over, the things that will occur that I don't even know what they are. And I have anxiety about, but I know that you hold my future. And I know that you know what good you can make of this mess of my life. And I know the hope you can offer others through me when I walk in hope in you. And that way we hand to the next generation, hope, 
hope of a life well lived, hope of a life with no regrets. I'm the no regrets woman. I actually own the trademark no regrets woman, my website, no regrets woman.com, because I believe that when Jesus said, build your house on the rock, have regrets. You man get on the beach. I get it. It's beautiful there. There's a hut, the ocean, it's gorgeous, but the storms are going to come. And when they come, the house on the beach is going to crumble. But when we build our life on the Lord Jesus Christ, beginning with a genuine relationship with him, I'm an evangelist at heart. If you don't know Jesus, message me. I will help you meet Jesus. And then living out every day, loving him through the pages of scripture, as we fall in love with who he is, and then what spills out of us is loving our neighbor as ourselves, because it's him doing it through us. It's not us trying harder. It's him loving through us and sharing the hope of the gospel through us without regrets. Amen. Amen. Friends, I don't know what regrets you're struggling with today. But what I do know is that we all have them. You're not alone. And God already knew about the circumstances that would lead to those regrets before you were ever in them. And he loves you so much that he's already created a way for you to move past them and live in the abundant life that he has for you, longs for you to have. I wanna close out this episode with Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24 that says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Today, we've been talking about God's word and how that provides us a way to move past the regrets that hold us back. And it starts with you coming clean before the Lord. He already loves you. He's already forgiven you, but he wants you to go to him and say, take this and teach me in the way everlasting. And I promise you, he will. Mm -hmm. Friends, this has been another episode of your hope-filled perspective. Rhonda, it's been a great conversation today. And friends, if you want to know more about Rhonda, if you want to learn about her ministry, if you want to pick up any of her books and read more about No Regrets and No Regrets Marriage, we will have all of her information in the show notes that you can find at drmichellebee.com. Until we meet again, this has been your hope-filled perspective. May you have a hope-filled, regret-free week.